not with the class. Can you all hear me? So last time we actually discussed a lot of stuff in theory about uh, gel electrophoresis. We saw agarose gel electrophoresis. We also discussed about protein gel electrophoresis, which is polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. In polyacrylamide, we saw native and SDS. So today it is going to be a, a recap of everything, but I have slides, so we'll go one by one. Polysaccharide, so agarose and page. Agarose is actually a polysaccharide extracted from seaweed. While when you talk about polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, it is cross-linked polymer of acrylamide. When you uh, mix the reagents, so there are certain set of reagents in polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Acrylamide is there, bisacrylamide is there. These are uh, suspensions because they, they are made in buffer. They are not made in water. So this is a powder. Acrylamide and bisacrylamide, it comes in a powder form. You have to weigh uh, weight by volume and then you have to add them to the buffer. You have to stir them, keep it on a stirrer. You have to dissolve them. They form a solution and then there is a ratio. So there's a proportion. So some fixed amount of acrylamide is taken and a fixed amount of bisacrylamide is taken, pipetted out actually because now they're liquid. They are mixed together and then you add other reagents like ammonium per sulfate, you add temid to it. So then when it cross links, it forms a gel. And that this gel is uh, absorbent in nature, it absorbs water. So it will always be like soft and gel-like gel substance. So that gel-like substance is possible because there is cross-linking. There is cross-linking of acrylamide. And that's why there are many, many molecules. There are many uh, molecules of acrylamide and little molecules or less molecules of bisacrylamide. And then after you add this APS and temid, the polymerization reaction is initiated and the cross-linkings are formed between acrylamide and bisacrylamide and hence uh, polyacrylamide gel. This is how the polyacrylamide gel is prepared. Now, agarose is very simple. You do not have any mixture of any um, other ingredients. It is basically the agarose powder. You dissolve it, uh, you add it to the buffer. Initially, it is granular. You add it to the buffer. You microwave it. Okay, you microwave it. Uh, because of the heat now, the agarose dissolves. You allow it to cool it to 50 degrees and don't cool it much further because then agarose will again solidify. But it solidifies, you can again keep it in the microwave. You can give heat, it liquefies. To that uh, molten agarose, which is not very hot, you're going to add ETBR, that is ethidium bromide. And that is important because it is an intercalating agent. It is a DNA intercalating agent. It sits in between the bases of DNA and it fluoresces under UV. So because when you're going to analyze your gel after running, you are going to see the fluorescence. You are going to see the DNA bands. It's because ethidium bromide has been added. What if you do not add ethidium bromide to the agarose gel? You will not be able to see the bands. Okay, so adding a fluorescent dye, some uh, this dye is very, very important. Now, agarose is non-toxic, but the ingredients are potent neurotoxins. So you have to handle with care. In both the cases, always whenever you are doing, basically whenever you are working in the lab, gloves are very important. It's not that this is non-toxic, so you can handle it without gloves. This is toxic, so that's why I'm going to wear gloves. No. Whenever you enter into your lab, you must always wear your lab coats. You must always wear safety glasses. You must always have gloves when you're handling some of the samples and you think. So these are some safety measures and these are some work ethics in the laboratory. But this is page is neurotoxin. So make sure that you do not touch it. Agarose is a horizontal gel electrophoresis. We saw the unit of agarose. We saw that video also. I hope you remember. Page is vertical. In agarose, you see bigger pores are there, okay? Uh, here in the page, you will see smaller gaps or smaller pores. And now because of the size of the pores, whatever samples are going to be separated also is influenced by the size of the pores, pores now. 
sorry not spores pores so here larger molecules larger the spores so it will be able to separate larger molecules smaller the pores it will be able to separate smaller dna uh, molecules and protein molecules this agarose gel is commonly used for dna separation the page is used for dna or protein separation when we saw about polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis again there are two types native and sds here native gel in this you always retain the native conformation you always retain the original conformation of your protein sample you do not change it so separation is based upon charge size and shape of the macromolecules you do not disturb the original conformation so that's why it is called as native when you are doing sds page the separation is based upon the molecular weight of proteins so here the charge is nullified that we are going to see uh, in the further slides useful for separation and or purification of mixture of proteins so again here also if you have a mixture of proteins you can separate them on the basis of charge you can separate them on the basis of size and shape in sds mostly it is actually a method which runs uh, which is on the basis of molecular weight of the proteins here the charge of all the proteins it can be a mixture of proteins of any size it can be a mixture of any size proteins but finally they are going to be separated on the basis of molecular weight it, uh, so there can be different charges sorry not sizes they can be different charges so if i give you a protein uh, if you if i give you a sample that sample may have a mixture of positively charged negatively charged proteins okay uh, so then what you do you treat it with sds now when you treat it with sds the protein tends to linearize the protein now acquires negative charges all of these small and big molecules now are having the same charge okay negative charge but what is changing is the molecular weight is changing so now sds page separates these proteins on the basis of molecular weight this was the original method of electrophoresis so this was developed first and this was the original method and uh, this sds page is very useful because it can help you to check the purity of the protein sample if your protein is a multimeric protein if it has like a if it is a monomer then that's not a problem but it's a dimer trimer you need to see what are the subunits of these proteins and the subunits are of different sizes of different molecular masses so when you do sds page you can separate the protein on the basis of their molecular weight so if a protein is contain containing many other subunits that can be separated very distinctly on by doing sds page when we talk about sds page what is the reason that we treat the protein with sds page okay the the rest of the process you know in native page and in sds page whatever reagents you are going to use acrylamide bisacrylamide temed aps the buffer these things are going to be the same now what is one thing that is going to change in the native there is no sds so i'll write it over here because i'll share these slides native no sds you do not need sds because you are not going to change the conformation here but in sds page you have an additional ingredient which is sds which is a detergent which is an anionic head group which has an anionic head group and a lipophilic tail so sodium dodecyl sulfate this is an amphipathic detergent it is having like a head and a tail okay so the it is this this head is an anionic in nature and the tail is lipophilic so has affinity towards lipids lipophilic fat this this part will have no affinity towards lipids so it is far away from the lipid but this will go and attach in the native form the protein folds into all possible shapes that's that's what we saw there are amino acids which make different there are different amino acids which make proteins then there is amino acid amino acid interaction and because of these interactions the bonds are formed so in their native form the protein folds into all possible shapes in a compact or an elongated conformation structure it could be it 
could be folded because of this interaction so what do you uh, what do you understand that from this because they are coming in different conformation they can be compact they can be elongated so the migration of the proteins the migration of these proteins through the gel now the gel is the gel is formed because of cross linking now because of the cross linking there will be a network inside the gel the gel looks very nice and homogeneous from the top but if you go into the details of the internal structure of the gels you are going to find there are pores there are sieves and these sieves will uh, are actually your molecule that you are going to load or the mixture of molecules that you are going to load on the gel it will have to pass through the sieves and the rate of migration will depend on uh, the relative compactness so if it is very compact it will be able to flow through that particular sieve but if it is all elongated if it is all spread out it is a loose it is not a compact protein then that can get stuck so obviously the compactness the molecular weight these are the two things that sds works on not the charge because i told you when you treat the protein with the sds uh, the protein is now having a uniform charge. The entire mix of proteins will have a uniform negative charge. The rate of migration of SDS treated proteins is effectively determined by their unfolded length related to their molecular weight. So I have a picture here. If you see, this is a protein. Now, this is a protein with folds. Okay. The proteins will have amino acids. Different amino acids carry different charges. So here is an amino acid which is positively charged. Here it is negatively charged negative negative positive so what happens is they have they interact with each other these amino acids they interact with each other because of the interactions now there can the protein takes a particular shape there will be bonds that are formed okay there are certain areas which are hydrophobic areas certain areas which are hydrophilic so based on all these properties the protein gets a shape the protein gets a conformation now after you treat it with SDS, you will see that it has linearized. So this becomes a linear protein. Initially, it was not linear. Now, after the treatment, it becomes linear. So now you have denatured. You have denatured the protein and the overall net charge is negative charge. The net negative charge comes on the linearized protein. Whereas here, it could be positive. It could be negative. It could be inclined towards more positive. Why? Because if the amino acids... Uh, the majority of the amino acids in this case are positive. So the protein will have more positive charges than the negative charges. If the majority of amino acids carry negative charges, then the protein is highly negatively charged, you can see. So the net charge of the protein is dependent up. It's an intrinsic property. It depends upon what kind of amino acids are there. The treatment, uh, when you treat it with SDS, you are now... Uh, making them uniformly charged throughout your linearizing you're making it negatively charged now the rate of migration of sds treated proteins is effectively determined by their unfolded length related to their molecular weight on treating the native protein with sds the conformation denatures the bonds break the conformation is not in compact anymore it is not folded anymore it is linearized the amino acid interactions also break the protein linearizes and because of that now the mobility of the protein is affected the linearized protein will carry negative charges and it will be separated on the basis of charge to mass ratio okay, finally sds treatment also separates subunits in a multimeric protein and complex aggregates so sds binds how what is the binding of sds it is non covalent so it binds no non-covalently to the protein. And because of this binding, it can mask the intrinsic charge of a protein. So if the protein is having more of positive charge, it is containing more of positively charged amino acids. When you treat it with SDS, it is going to mask all those charges and uniformly impart negative charges. Roughly, one SDS molecule is attracted to every two amino acids. So this is... 1 is to 2, roughly. So 1 SDS will attract 2 amino acids, roughly. And all protein molecules will move towards the anode during the SDS page. Why will it move to anode? What is anode? What is the charge? 
on anode can you all please type it in the chat box which which electrode is anode is it negative electrode or positive electrode after you charge the after you treat the protein with sds the protein becomes negatively charged so where will it move to the anode so what is the charge on the anode electrode please quickly type positive yes so the anode is positive now your proteins have been treated with sds so the they will all move towards the opposite side which is the anode now polyacrylamide we'll just look into the little bit details of cross linking okay yes aditi and uh, mitali that's correct a polyacrylamide gel is formed using the different components so these are the ingredients acrylamide bisacrylamide is mixed it's a mixture you have trisacyl buffer you have water you have sds now this sds is only when you do an sds gel okay i have mentioned it here sds is only added for sds page and not native so if you are doing a native gel you have to eliminate this if you are doing an sds gel you have to add it 10% ammonium per sulfate and then temid we also saw we are going to also see the two different uh, parts of the gel when you run a gel there is a separating gel and there is a stacking gel what is the importance of both of them we are going to see that now now the reagents the ingredients could be the same the in ingredients are always the same but the quantities may vary like lab to lab some people follow different uh, recipes they might take little more of this depending upon what kind of results they get some people follow this some people may just change the quantities a little bit but these basic ingredients they remain the same so when you are taking a polyacrylamide so this is your acrylamide solution uh, molecules which are blue in color and these are the bisacrylamide uh, component when you add them together and you add these rest of the uh ingredients i told you sds is optional depending upon what type of gel you are running but aps and temid are constant they have to be there now when you add all of them you get this kind of a polymerized gel and you can also see that how the linking has happened so if i try to just darken it just for your so this is a these are the two acrylamide so these this is like a chain of acrylamide and in between you will see that now the bisacrylamide has come and this sort of linking is known as cross linking so there's one chain of acrylamide and bisacrylamide and in between the two chains now the bisacrylamide molecules already come with this kind of a bond here so they are connecting they are connecting the two rows and that's what is called as cross linking so they are linking they are linking across the two rows so that is cross linking and because of this cross linking there is a network kind of a thing formed and that leads to mesh that leads to a sieve system okay now basically polyacrylamide is cross linked polymer of acrylamide so that is why the word comes as poly it's because it is cross linked polymer of acrylamide it is a known neurotoxin and it should be handled with caution you should always wear hand gloves while casting the gel this polyacrylamide is highly water absorbent so when you cast it it forms a soft gel on hydration when in, when there is um, you just leave the gel you cast the gel it is very uh, soft it is uh, hydrated and if you just leave it it will dry and it will become dehydrated it just becomes very very um, hard very very thin just like a papad you can even break it okay so it and when you add water to it it will become soft again so hydration and dehydration you'll observe that with this gel now do not add sds for a native gel rest all the reagents are going to be the same for native acrylamide on its own forms linear polymers the bisacrylamide introduces cross links between polyacrylamide chains so acrylamide has this tendency of follow, um, linking together and for, um, forming a linear polymer chain but you need bisacrylamide because cross linking is only possible when you add bisacrylamide to it and that's how you get the sieve system 
okay the ratio of acrylamide to bisacrylamide determines the pore size usually there is a fixed ratio uh, where if you look at this particular yeah so what is the ratio 19 is to 1 weight by weight ratio of acrylamide to bisacrylamide is followed standard that's the standard because if you increase the amount of sds or if you increase the amount of either of them you may not get the desired uh, pore size gel so higher concentration of acrylamide will cause low electrophoretic mobility because more the acrylamide then the uh, cross linking and all that will lead to say smaller pore sizes extremely smaller pore sizes so when there are very small pores obviously the protein molecules will not be able to pass through the sieves easily so that will be low electrophoretic mobility so that's why we follow a constant ratio between acrylamide and bisacrylamide throughout any doubts you can type it in the chat box okay now uh, what is the role of Stacking. So let we will also see what is the role of ammonium persulfate. We will also see what is temid. Now temid and uh, this ammonium persulfate and the temid, they are usually added at the last. Both of them are known to initiate polymerization. Temid promotes polymerization. APS initiates polymerization. So as soon as you add them to the mix you immediately so before you even start mixing the reagents you should always prepare the gel unit we saw in the last video how do you prepare the gel unit there are those glass plates there is a spacer between the glass plate you have to fix the spacer so that there is a gap between the two gel plates the glass plates then you fix them in the unit you fix them in the unit you check whether it is leaking or not you can use water for that you can dip it in water you can see if it is leaking. If it is not leaking, now you're good to go. Now you start casting the gel. As soon as you add acrylamide, bisacrylamide, buffer, water, now mix it gently. There should be no air bubbles while mixing. You add ammonium persulfate, temid. If you're doing a native, these are the ingredients. If you're doing SDS, then SDS is an additional um, reagent added there. Now, as soon as you add these ammonium persulfate and temid, give a gentle stir and immediately pour it into the mold or whatever gel unit you have prepared. Now, because if you keep it for a longer time, you will see that the gel has polymerized in the container itself. It is now not free flowing now. It has become a semi-solid uh, lump. It will not pass. So you have to cast another gel. Okay. Now, when you look at the gel, this is how it looks. Okay, we saw that there is a separating gel and there is a stacking gel. There are some differences in the composition of a separating gel and a stacking gel. If you look at this, the, uh, the amount, you're going to use the same 19 is to 1 weight by weight ratio in both the cases, but the separating gel has more quantity and the stacking gel has a less quantity. Everywhere you will see that rest of the things followed are the same but the acrylamide and the bisacrylamide concentration or the quantity is less okay water also is more here in this case the top portion is referred to as stacking gel and the lower portion is referred to as a separating gel this is also called as a resolving gel now stacking gel is very important see the reason is because we are going to add our sample in these wells. Now, our sample is not containing, is, is actually a mixture. Now, this mixture is containing proteins of different sizes, right? So, electrophoretic mobility. Now, different sizes are going to migrate differently. Some will migrate faster, some will migrate slow, right? But we do not want that immediately. We first want to, as soon as you add the protein, we want them to first start the race while they all come to a same line. So whenever there is a competition, whenever there is a sprint race, a running race, first all the participants are made to stand in a row in the same line. Nobody is standing ahead, nobody is standing 
behind okay they all are standing in a straight line why because the race has to start from the beginning line so that you know that who came first right so here the same thing is applied here since they are all of different sizes lining them up before they enter into the separating gel is very very important because now the proteins will enter the separating gel at the same time before the migration at different rate is based on their sizes okay so just to um, just to bring them in the same line just to make sure that before they enter into the separating gel they are all starting at from the same point stacking gel does that job and what is the benefit of using a stacking gel yes it linearizes secondly because of the stacking gel now they all enter into the resolving gel at the same time so you it leads to clear and better separated bands for visualization and analysis so without the stacking gel what would happen without the stacking gel the proteins will just produce a long smear so if you do not have a stacking gel and if you have an entire separating gel you will not see bands okay you will not see the bands like this you will just see a smear you will just see a smear and that is not good that is not a good quality of gel because then you are not going to get any conclusive results from running a gel so the both the gels should have stacking gel because you saw the amount of separate uh, the amount of acrylamide to bisacrylamide is varying in both in stacking and separating so that is for a reason the word stacking itself means that um lining up things i stacked up something is keeping things in one place so here you are going to line up the different sized proteins and then before they enter into the separating gel now they are ready to go at the same time because everybody every proteins electrophoretic mobility is different based on their sizes so stacking promotes better resolution and sharper bands in the separating gel so we saw this how do you make it you first set up the gel unit you have these things are known as spacers actually spacers are important imagine that you have two glass plates and you just keep them on top of each other there will be no space okay if there is no gap in between those two plates how will a gel film form so you need to uh, you need to introduce gaps how would you introduce gaps you need to add a spacer now if you have two gel plates and if you have a ruler a, a plastic ruler that is there in your compass box if you now put those two rulers on two sides between the two plates then you are developing a you are introducing a space between the two plates and because of that space now whatever you pour inside will remain inside will take that space and a sheet or a film is formed so that's why the spacer is very important in the unit in the electrophoretic unit assembly itself the spacers are provided okay so take the two plates introduce the spacer now when you introduce the spacer uh, level them up put it in the electrophore in the uh, casting unit okay last time we saw the casting unit air tight you have to seal it there are those uh, you have to just lock it when you lock it and then you add water to the pipette and you see whether there is a leak make sure there are no leakages now when there is no leakage either you uh, lift the casting unit and upside down and pour off the water but i said to you that that is not advisable because you do not want to disturb the casting unit now that it is not leaking so you take a filter paper pass it inside dab out all the water and now you can start making the mix your mix will contain acrylamide bisacrylamide and uh, sds if it is an sds gel no sds if it is a native gel you can add temid water buffer aps temid and aps are added at the last gentle stir and then you can pip it in all the separating gel mix after you do that you add isopropyl uh, isopropyl alcohol you can add butanol also so why because it will level up so you do not want your stacking gel surface abrupt like this okay you do not want it you want a smooth surface so to ensure that 
your uh, surface is smooth, the separating gel surface is smooth, you can add butanol or you can add IPA along the gel surface to smoothen it. After that, when it is, uh, after give some five, 10 minutes to polymerize, you will see that the gel is now smooth. Now you can remove off the butanol by again, uh, filter paper, just put on a filter paper, put slide a filter paper inside and dab it out. Now you can cast the stacking gel. You know the, you know the ingredients, you know the quantities also, make the stacking gel, add it on the top, whatever space is remaining now. After that, you insert the comb. So when you insert the comb, again, watch for air bubbles. We do not need any air bubbles. Leave it for some time. And then you need to pull it out. Before pull it, pulling it out, usually some buffer is added so that because of the buffer, the, the process is eased out. The pulling becomes easy because water slides, the buffer slides into all the gaps and it acts as a lubricant. It acts as a lubricant. And because of that, it is easy to pull out a comb. Now your gel is ready. You have made a separating gel on top of it is a stacking gel with all the wells that are formed. <coughs> Sorry. So this is how your entire unit looks now. And then you can connect the electrodes to the power pack. Okay. You load the gel, you load your samples into the wells. The protein samples are having some reagents. The protein sample is basically colorless. So you're going to add a dye to it. What is that dye? Do you remember last time we discussed? What are we going to add to the protein mix? It looks blue in color, but the protein sample that I, that has been provided to you is not colored because most of it is cell lysate. For example, you're going to lyse the cells and you're going to break open the cell and you're going to take that as your sample that you're going to load into the gel, onto the gel. So is it colored? No, it is not colored. So you make it colored. Why do you make it colored? Please type the answers in your chat box. Why do? Why is it required? Why is it required to make the sample colored? Why can't you just run a non-colored, a colorless sample? Can you all do it fast so that we move on to the next slide? I told you generally it is blue colored dye that you're going to add. Why should you color the sample before you load it onto the gel? Anybody can even put on the mic and can answer. Which is that dye that is added? So you add a dye and then you load the sample in the wells. You put on the um, power pack and as soon as the power pack is on, you will see that the electrophoretic mobility is happening. Now the migration of the samples have started. If you have treated the sample with SDS, they are all negatively charged. So they are going to move towards the anode. Okay. And after the gel has completed, you see that you'll see the gel front here till here it has run. You do not want to overrun the gel. You will see that the blue dye has traveled till here. So you stop the gel, remove the gel, you wash it, and then you start staining it. We also saw different staining procedures last time. Can you all please type it in the chat box, somebody? If you all remember, what are the stainings? What are the stains that are used to uh, stain a protein gel? What are the different types of stains? We saw that video, if you remember, last Wednesday. Nobody remembers it? Okay, so that you'll have to refer to a book or some my slides that I gave last time and find out the answer. Okay, 
So um, with this, we now move to the second, um, the last part actually from this unit, from this chapter unit, that is the 2D gel electrophoresis. We saw one, we have already seen 1D, that is native or SDS. We are also now going to see 2D. Before that, I would just like to tell you all about this, little bit about the sample preparation. When you are doing a native gel, you do not treat your sample with anything. You can load your sample as it is. So only thing you have to do is you dialyze the sample. Okay. What is dialysis? Now, when you have a mixture of, so basically if you're working, say with a bacteria, Okay, so you working, I uh, you working with the bacteria. Now this bacteria, say, is pro producing a very important, industrially important enzyme. For example, say it is producing lipase. Lipase is an industrially important enzyme. You also must know that all enzymes are proteins. Okay, so you can also do a protein gel electrophoresis to separate this enzyme to see whether this enzyme is produced or not by the bacteria. Now you have to produce lipase. How would you do that? You have to put the bacteria into a medium. Lipase producing medium. Okay, you can, you can make the medium in the laboratory. It is a liquid medium, like how you make nutrient broth. Similarly, you will have a medium which is liquid which is a broth and which is used to where you can add your bacteria to that medium, keep it on the shaker. You have all the optimum, you know, all the optimum conditions at what temperature, at what pH the bacteria produces lipase. Now you have this flask that has the media and you have inoculated the bacteria into it. Now the bacteria will grow. It will produce lipase. So suppose now, the lipase that is produced is here in the medium, okay? So now your broth is a mixture of a lot of things. It is not only the lipase. It will be a lot of others, other things also that are being produced by lipase, which you do not want. You're not interested in life. Other, other than lipase, you're not interested in anything. So what should you do? Separation is very important now. You must separate, okay? So this flask, you have to now subject to first centrifugation. If you all remember, I also told you, it also depends that whether this protein or whether this analyte is extracellular or intracellular. If it is extracellular, cellular, your job is easy. You can do centrifugation. If the bacteria is producing the protein, but it is not giving it out, if it is storing it within itself, then it is intracellular. So in such a case, like if I have this bacterial cell, if I have this bacterial cell and which, has, which is producing this very important enzyme, but it is not secreting it out. It is just keeping it inside. So this is intracellular. Okay, this is intracellular. Now, how do I extract it? Can you all tell me? What are the ways, what, what is the way that I can get this out? What will I have to do? How will I have to treat the bacteria to get that out, to get this lipase out? Yes, please write it. Ajinkya, Akshata, Anushka, Arfat. Siddhika, Samiksha, so many people are there. Can you all answer something? How will I remove the intracellular protein from a cell, which is locked inside a cell, which is stored inside a cell? What should I do? Mitali. Hello. First, we can separate it. Pardon? A bit louder? Um, first, we can separate it. No, I'm asking that if your enzyme or protein or whatever analyte you are interested in is produced by the bacteria, but the bacteria is 
inside the cell. Okay, you mean to say that first you isolate the cells. Yes, ma'am. How do you isolate the cells? Yes, we should be right. You centrifuge them. You centrifuge them, then what will happen when you centrifuge the entire broth which is containing your bacteria? What will happen? If I centrifuge it, this is a centrifuge tube and I filled in the broth in this and then I centrifuged it. So what will happen? Where will be the cells? Will the cells form a... Will they settle down? After centrifugation, because the cells are now heavier, the cells are denser. So what will happen? The cells will settle down. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So it will settle down and also because you're centrifuging it at a very high speed. Yes. So they will also fix themselves in one place like this. So this is going to be the cell mass. Okay. And this above thing is going to be the broth it can have a lot of small things which are which you do not want because your interest is in the cell mass so this is known as a supernatant the thing that is not the pellet so when you centrifuge there are two parts first is a supernatant this is a pellet now you have a pellet now based on whether your protein is extracellular or intracellular if it is extracellular, then where will the protein be? Whether it will be in the supernatant or in the pellets? If your protein is extracellular, which means that the cell has already given out the protein. Okay. So after it gives out the protein, if it releases the protein, where in which part will it be? Whether it will be in the supernatant or whether it will be in the pellets? No, if, it, if your protein is extracellular. If your protein is intracellular, it will be in the pellet. But what if your protein is extracellular, Aditi? Then it will be in the supernatant. Correct. Supernatant. Yes. So, if you're pro so what has happened is basically, uh, if you know there is something like a stationary phase. If you study the growth phase of a bacteria, okay, initially it picks up slowly, it increases. And then it achieves a platform. Okay. So there are three different phases the lag phase, the log phase, and the stationary phase. So in the stationary phase, the maximum growth has attained. Okay. The bacteria here is not further dividing anymore. Why? Because the medium that you have provided, the medium, what is the purpose of the medium, the nutrient broth, luria broth, or any broth that you growth medium that you uh, add your bacteria inside? Why is the medium required? What does the medium provide? Give, give your answer in simple words. It's okay. There's no need to be very correct microbiologically. But what is the media required for? What will happen if you do not provide a growth medium to the bacteria? The word itself tells you growth medium. What will happen if I do not provide the growth medium to the bacteria? Yes, no nutrition for the bacteria. So it basically, if I am adding the bacteria in the medium, it means that I'm providing nutrition. Now this nutrition is carbon, nitrogen. Okay, so very importantly, carbon and nitrogen sources that you're adding. So your medium can have glucose, your medium can have yeast extract, peptone. So these are because they are providing carbon, nitrogen, some, some, high, some bacteria also have some further requirements. So you're making sure that the bacteria is getting all the nutrition for growth. Now, when I add, say, supposedly I have, say one, I just have add a single bacteria into this flask, which is containing the growth medium. So you know that they divide. So one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight. So after some time, there will be many cells. Okay, so many cells in the same amount of medium. Do you think that the nutrition or the nutrients is going to remain as it is after 24 hours after the number of cells have increased, will the nutrients in the growth media medium remain the same? No. What will happen? 
more the members, more will be the exhaustion of the nutrients. Higher, faster will be the exhaustion of the nutrients. So it means that many cells will require nutrients. Now they are all going to feed up on this nutrient amount, which is there in the flask. And there will come a point when there will be no nutrients left. So now when there is no nutrient left, will there be any more cells, cell division happening? When there is no nutrient left, will there be any more Nutri um, any more cell division happening? No, oh, ma'am. No, it will not happen. Correct. So then that phase you will see is the stationary phase. When you take the spectrophotometric reading, you will do you do the visible UV spectroscopy. You will see that when you get that data and when you plot the data, this is the phase which is known as the stationary phase. It is also called as the death phase. Now, suppose in this phase for the longest time. There is no nutrients available. Will the bacteria survive? Will the bacteria survive? No, they will no. not. Survive. So they will die. What will happen they will, when they will die? This is the cell. It is not getting any food now. It is not getting any nutrient now. What will happen? Yes, it will lies. It will die. It will lies. It will release all the components into the medium. That could be one point where the enzyme also comes out. Your analyte, your protein also comes out. Okay, into the medium now. The cell has died. There are this 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 is known as extracellular secretion. Not necessarily that the bacteria will release everything in the stationary phase. Some of them might also release it before the stationary phase. But stationary phase is a phase where now there is no more nutrient available in the medium. Now there is no more further growth of the bacteria and the bacteria will soon die because of the inadequate nutrients. Okay. But some of them may retain the analyte, the protein, the enzyme that you want within the cell itself. They do not leave it out. So they, they are known as intracellular. In that case, you will have to, in both the cases, even if it is extracellular, even if it is intracellular, okay? In both the cases, centrifugation is a must. So if it is extracellular, the analyte, uh, the, ch the chances are high that the analyte is going to be in the supernatant. If it is intracellular, this, the protein or the analyte is going to be in the cells itself. Now the cells are denser, so when you centrifuge, they will settle down like this and they form a pellet. So the analyte, the protein is going to be in the pellet. Okay. Now you take the pellet and you break it. You add say lysozyme or you add any other reagent which can break open the cells so that you can now take your analyte out. Okay. And in supernatant, it is easy because already the analyte is in the supernatant, but the supernatant will have your analyte in a diluted form. You may need to concentrate it. After all of this is done, now is your protein, even if you lies open the cell or even if the analyte is there in the supernatant, is your protein or is the mixture a pure mixture, pure in the sense? pH. Now your growth medium will have a pH of say 7. The supernatant will contain a mixture of molecules. It will be smaller to bigger. Okay. The cell pellet also when you break open, there are a lot of other components of the cells that will also come out with your molecule of interest. Okay. So what do you need? You need to dialyze it. The dialysis is one very important process in uh, protein biochemistry or whenever you're working with such biomolecules where you get a mixture of proteins. You do not get only your protein, but you get many other proteins also. So what will you do? These proteins are small and big. Now you dialyze it. So the dialysis bag is commercially available. The dialysis bag is also having pore sizes. Okay, now this pore sizes uh, act like a sieve. Okay, so imagine, and they have certain cutoff values. Okay, now the dialysis bag is, you have to first, it's, it, it comes like a thin strip and the strip is basic, it's like a bag, 
it's like a column it's like a pipe you can say okay so when you open it yeah but when it comes commercially the it is not open the mouths are not open it comes like a cello tape okay it comes like exactly like how a cello tape looks so you have to only thing is that it is not sticky like a cello tape so it is just rolled and you remove it you decide how much sample you have say suppose i have only 5 ml sample if i have a 5 ml supernatant or if i have lysed the pellet and 5 ml of uh, so this is there mix is there i have to dilyze the 5 ml so what do i do i cut the cello tape i cut the uh, this dilysis tape i boil it i put it into boiling water after it boils it opens up okay it opens up now i can see that it has take the mouth is open the both the ends are open so i tie a knot at the lower end i tie a knot now only this has a open mouth so it becomes like a bag okay it is a dialysis bag fine now i add the sample into this what i do is i take a big container i fill it with a buffer i know say suppose this lipase is say stable at ph 7 so i take a buffer of ph 7 fill it now this is a big container this could be somewhere around say 200 ml of buffer because my analyte my sample mixes only 5 ml so 200 ml of buffer is okay i put the fill up the 5 ml in this there are dialysis clips you can clip here so that nothing goes out nothing comes in nothing goes out through the mouth and nothing comes in through the mouth i suspend it inside so now my bag is hanging like this in the buffer i have tied a knot here i can also put a clamp here okay instead of tying a knot i can put two clamps one on the top one on this edge uh, and here now the sample is here inside in the sample now you can have a mix of things this may be something that you do not want you are interested in only the green ones that is your life is okay but this thing is a mixture it can contain a lot of other things okay like this now what will happen now i told you that these cellular uh, these bags they come in different cut off sizes what do you mean by cut off sizes is that kind of diagram visible to you or should i make a big one so that it is easily seen on the screen do you see uh, do you find it difficult to see that small diagram of dialysis bag hello uh, yes ma'am a little okay 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 so see this is your dialysis bag now just your dialysis bag okay you have clamped it on both the sides so this is the bottom size part this is the top part that you have clamped and now it is suspended in the buffer so let us assume that this is the yellow the blue thing is the buffer outside in the outside area in the dialysis bag is your lipase and along with lipase there are certain other things cellular components it could be other proteins other junk things broken cell parts okay which have come okay now this is a very initial step of purification what you are doing is you are not directly subjecting this sample to chromatography before chromatography you must do dialysis so after you do dialysis then you minimize some more contamination then you can go to chromatography then you can go for electrophoresis or whatever other things you want to do but this is the initial step dialysis now this protein this uh, protein ka cut off lipase protein cut off say is this the size or the molecular mass of this protein is um 35 kilo dalton okay that is the size of your lipase so obviously if you want to use a bag now if you want to keep the protein inside the bag just listen to this carefully if i want to keep the protein inside the bag should the pore size there are small tiny pores here 
should the pore size be larger than the size of the lipase or smaller than the size of the lipase? If I want to retain, if I want to keep the lipase inside the bag, then the pore size of the bag should be larger than the lipase or smaller than the lipase? Um, smaller. Smaller than the lipase, correct. So if I have a 35 kilo Dalton lipase, then my cutoff value of this, uh, this cellular, this dialysis bag should be somewhere around, say, you can use a 30 kilo Dalton because you know that you only are interested in this green big lipase. You're not interested in these ones, small ones. So if I take, say, a 30 kilo Dalton cutoff, all of them will go out in the buffer. They all will exit. Okay, they all will exit. What remains inside is your lipase. So this is the first step. You get rid of the stuff which you do not want from, a, from the medium. It could be a pellet that is broken later on. It could be the supernatant which is actually containing a lot many things. Okay, so but how, you know, you will say that ma'am, this is the first time I am doing this. How will I know that the size of the lipase is 35 kilo Dalton? That is also a good question now. How do you know you're doing it for the first time? So how do you know that what kind, what is the size of the lipase? How do you know that what is the um, cutoff value that I should need? So you can do an experiment. You first run the, you first inoculate the bacteria into the lipase producing medium. Then you first determine whether it is intracellular or extracellular. How is that done? If it is an extracellular, all you have to do is Take the supernatant, load it on a native polyacrylamide gel. Native. Okay. You can see the, you can develop the stains, you can develop the gel. But again, when you do a native, you will not be able to see the size because polyacrylamide gel, native polyacrylamide gel only works on charge. Right. You do not know the size. So what is the other method where you can do the analysis based on size? molecular weight, you can do an SDS page also. So you can do a native, you can do an SDS page. Then along in the SDS page, you have already loaded a marker also. So that marker is containing say different, uh, it will give you an account. It's a standard marker. Then your, when you stain this uh, gel, whichever lane is containing your uh, sample after developing, after staining the gel, you will see that. So suppose if there are these, um, So suppose say this is a marker lane. Okay, and this is where you have loaded your sample. So here it is your sample that you are loading, and here is the marker. So it will it will run. After it runs, and after the gel is over, you are going to stain it. After you stain, you will see that the marker will have say certain bands at certain positions. This will not change. These are the bands and these bands are going to have fixed molecular weight. Now suppose this band, this is your standard. So this is of 35 kilo Dalton. And when you develop the gel, you see that in your sample, you're also seeing a band here. Okay, you'll also see some minute bands here and there like this, but this is a very strong band with a very strong, uh, I told you, if the concentration of that particular analyte is more, the, the intensity of the band is also more. So looking at this intensity, you will say that, yes, I have a protein which is corresponding to 35 kilo Dalton. Is this clear to everybody now that how will you find the molecular mass of the protein, the rough, the rough estimation? Okay, before you even decide that you want to go for um, any other uh, analysis, you, you must know what is the protein that is formed first, whether it is producing lipase or not, and whether if it is producing lipase, then what is the molecular mass of it? So now you find out the molecular mass of it by doing a protein gel. But still the question remains, how do I know whether it is lipase or not? Then what I have to do is I have to do a lipase assay. What do you mean by lipase assay? You know that every enzyme has a substrate. So you can do an assay in the laboratory. There are different assay protocols where you add your uh, broth. You know what is the substrate. Now, since lipase, it means it will hydrolyze a lipid. 
your enzyme should be able to cleave a lipid. So you find out a suitable assay method. You add a lipid plus your protein to it and you incubate it for some time. You will develop some color, add a reagent, you will develop the color. UV spectroscopy, uh, with the help of that, you determine the concentration and the this is going to tell you whether your sample has lipase or not. So now you have a broth, you have figured out whether it is extracellular, intracellular, you have figured out whether it is lipase or not, you have figured out the molecular mass. So based on the molecular mass, you have also figured out whether your sample contains lipase or not. So after these three things are done, you move to dialysis. After you do dialysis, then you are ready for chromatography, you can do electrophoresis now to isolate that protein. You can do column chromatography. So you can take this dialyzed uh, sample now. You can take this. You can now load it on the gel. So you can do affinity chromatography if you want, or you can do um, size exclusion chromatography, okay? After the step of dialysis. Is this, is this uh, understood or still any more doubts here? No, ma'am. Okay, any doubt, please ask. I was planning to show something, but it's okay. I'll, I'll find a link and I'll share a dialysis uh, link. Okay, today we'll now we will move on to the next, which is the last small part is the difference between 1D and difference between 2D. So when we saw um, page, native page, what was the basis on which we were um, doing the electrophoresis? It was charge, size, okay? When you do an SDS page, SDS page may you bring all of them to negative charge only. So what is that is considered as mass. So only, you know, one dimension of protein is used here. So protein is only separated on the basis of charge or protein is only separated on the basis of molecular weight. That is considering only one dimension, one property of the protein. That's the separation which is very, uh, the separation which is based only on molecular weight or only on the charge of the protein is called as 1D gel electrophoresis. Okay. What is 2D gel electrophoresis? Now this separation of proteins is based on the protein's molecular weight and isoelectric pH, okay? So 2D electrophoresis is going to be based on two properties of the protein, two dimensions of the protein. The first is isoelectric pH or isoelectric point. Second is the protein's molecular weight. So these are the two properties that 2D gel electrophoresis uses. 1D gel electrophoresis is only focusing either on the charge or on the mass. It is a low resolution gel. You do see bands, but then if you compare it with 2D, it is a low resolution. Whereas high resolution, this is very high resolution. It gives very clear, sharp, and all the information necessary Whatever you require to know about the protein, this 2D gel electrophoresis will give you all those results. It is a high resolution jaw, uh, gel. Uh, it is very costly. When you do this 1D, uh, that is SDS, or you do native, or you do agarose, these are, all, these are all 1D gel electrophoresis. So they are not so costly. They can be easily done. They do not require any uh, skillful, they do require skillful uh, hands, techniques, but again, Errors are there, little bit errors also do not actually cause a lot of problem here. But in 2D gel electrophoresis, of course, it's costly. You have to be very uh, careful that you're not going to cause any error while doing 2D, 2D gel electrophoresis. So we will see what exactly is 2D gel electrophoresis. As I said, we are going to exploit two characters on it. So first is isoelectric point and the second one is the molecular weight. So proteins are separated using two dimensional gel electrophoresis, which is known as 2D gel electrophoresis. It was first introduced by PH O'Farrell and Close in 1975. Now in this, you need to first find out what is, an isoelect what is the isoelectric point of that protein 
or of that biomolecule. And secondly, and the separation is going to be based on the molecular weight. Now, determination of the isoelectric point is based on the pH level. See, uh, what last time, if you remember, I was explaining you some terms, amphoteric nature, or what is, a, there is a point, there is a pH for every protein. So pH, stability pH is different. Some proteins will act uh, fine. Some proteins will do perfect chemical react, biochemical reactions at a certain pH. For example, salivary amylase. I'm using this example because you have studied this at, in the school. That's why. Salivary amylase pH. Can you tell me what is the pH of salivary amylase, which is there in our mouth? which is one of the important amylase uh, enzymes for digestion. What is the pH of salivary amylase? Anybody? Do you remember? Studied in 10th standard. What is it? Acidic, neutral, basic. What is the pH? What is your mouth? Is your mouth acidic right now? Neutral? I'm around 6 to around 7. Six to around 7. Around seven. Yes, around seven. So yes, it is neutral, okay? Now this pH of neutral, neutral pH is very, very important for the functioning of salivary amylase. When you go down in the digestive system, in the stomach, what do you have? Which enzyme do you have in the stomach? Do you remember any enzyme that is there in the stomach which helps in pepsin? pepsin correct. So what is the... What is the pH of stomach? Acidic, neutral, basic, acidic. High, highly acidic. Highly acidic. So in this acidic pH, pepsin performs, okay, performs the biochemical reactions. What will happen if I put salivary amylase in acidic pH and if I bring pepsin to neutral pH? Will they function if I change the pH? No, ma'am. No. So why? Because... Uh, enzymes and proteins are very specific about pH. They will only perform their job in optimum pH, in the pH in which they are suitable, they are comfortable. So if I change this salivary amylase, if I put it into the stomach, an acidic pH, it will not work. What will happen? It may denature. The, the, the extremely acidic pH may actually break down a lot of amino acid interactions. It will denature. If I do the same for pepsin, if I bring it into a neutral pH, it might also denature. It will become inactive. So every protein has its own optimum pH. Okay. Also, every protein has a pH at which the total net charge of the protein is zero. Okay. The total. Now, remember that optimum pH and pi is different so ph and pi every protein has an optimum ph but every protein has a ph where the net charge on the protein is zero that is known as the isoelectric point of that particular protein okay is this clear is this clear or not understood still Yes or no? Please type it in the chat box, then I can move ahead. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Do you want me to repeat it again? No, ma'am. No, okay. So every protein has an optimum pH. That is a different case. But every protein also has a pH at which the total net charge on it is zero. So it will have equal number of positive charges. It will have equal number of negative charges. They cancel out each other and the net charge becomes zero. So that pH is known as the isoelectric point. Okay. Now first you determine the isoelectric point of the protein. When you do that, the first step of 2D gel electrophoresis is run the protein through a isoelectric, through a pH gradient, I would say. Run the protein through a pH gradient, then as I told you that at a particular pH, the protein will have a zero charge. It will, you will see a band there. Okay, you will see that which is that point. Then after you do that, subject the protein to SDS page for molecular weight resolution. 
So in a 2D gel electrophoresis, initially protein migrates over a set of pH gradient. Okay, then the proteins are separated using gel electrophoresis. It could be vertical or horizontal. This gel electrophoresis is SDS gel electrophoresis because molecular weight comes into the picture. Now, advantages is that the protein resolution by this method is very sharp, accurate, very easy to interpret and proteins isolated are very pure as well. Okay, widely used for the analysis of complex protein molecules from cells, tissues, very sensitive method, very accurate method. So you can do uh, use this for a wide uh, range of samples. The first dimension, since it's a 2D, so there are two dimensions. The first dimension, isoelectric focusing, separates proteins according to their isoelectric pH, isoelectric point rather, which is known as PI, okay? The PI is a pH where the proteins carry zero charge. The second dimension is SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, separates the proteins on their molecular weights. Each spot on the resulting two-dimensional array corresponds to a single protein species in the sample, okay? So when you do a 2D gel, you will see spots. You will not see bands there. You will see spots after developing. So each spot will correspond to a single protein species. I have probably some animations that I had added just for you all to see. Two-dimensional gel electrophoresis is a procedure for separating a mixture of proteins into spots on a gel. In the first dimension, proteins are separated in a tube gel according to... Okay, so see, you can make a tube gel or you can get ready-made PI strips, okay? Now, these days, if, you, uh, if the lab is having a lot of money, if they can afford, then they can go for commercial PI strips. You get those strips. On those strips, you first run your sample and then you take out that strip and then keep it on the SDS gel. You can do that or you can make a tube gel in the lab. Now this tube gel will be made up of different pH. So there will be a pH gradient. To their isoelectric points. When a protein in the tube gel reaches the pH where its net charge is zero, it stops migrating and forms a band at that location. So if you look at this pH tube, now this pH tube is from pH 4 to pH 10. So this is known as a gradient. So there is a gradual increase in the pH. Gradient is that there is a gradual increase of any um, uh, property. It can be pH, it can be charge, it could be a charge gradient, it could be a pH gradient. So what does it mean? It doesn't abruptly go to 10, it will gradually go to 10. So pH 4, 4.5, 5, 5 some, something like this, okay? So you have a tube gel now, which has a pH gradient, you load your sample, you run your sample on this, depending upon the pi. So there will be a pH of the protein of the analyte at which the uh, charge on the protein, the net charge on the protein is zero. That is going to be your PI. So depending upon that, your protein will stop migrating when it reaches its PI. When it comes to its corresponding PI, it will stop migrating. Because when the charge on a protein is zero, will it migrate? No. Only when the charge on a protein is minus, it will migrate to positive. If the charge on the protein is positive, it will migrate to negative terminal. That is a cathode. But if the charge on the protein is zero, it will not migrate anywhere. It will just be wherever it is. So when it comes, suppose the lipase, uh, the PI of the lipase is five. So when it comes to say pH five, it is attaining zero charge. So then it will stay there. That is, that is the iso, isoelectric point of that particular lipase. Since two or more proteins may have identical isoelectric points, the bands in the tube gel may not contain a single type of protein. The isoelectric focusing tube gel is then laid on the top of a slab gel which is an SDS gel that separates proteins according to their masses. So the first part is done. You have already separated the protein based on the isoelectric point. If in a mixture, there could be lipase and there could be some other protein also, which will have the same PI. So suppose the 
PI here, this band particularly, is actually for lipase also and for other biomolecules also. So it will come as one band itself. Okay. But when you do an STS gel, now you are working on molecular mass. So this band will have the proteins of the same PI, but those proteins could be of different molecular masses. So when you do an SDS gel, you will not get one band, you will get separate bands because separate proteins have the same PI, but that separate proteins may not have the same molecular mass. So now the second dimension here is the SDS. You are going to resolve them on the basis of molecular masses. The proteins within the tube gel are electrophoresed into the slab gel and then move through the slab gel. Smaller proteins move more quickly than larger ones. In most cases, each type of protein forms a discrete spot that can be identified by staining methods. So see, you, will going to, you are not going to get like those bands. You are going to get these spots. When you develop the gel, you are going to see the spots. Individual spots in the gel can then be quantitated, extracted, and analyzed. Yeah, you can also extract, you can also analyze them after the gel is run. There is one more uh, lab, Evnova. That was also good. So see, this is a commercial kit, how it is done. If uh, initially they would make a tube gel in the laboratory uh, of pH gradient and they would load it. But now there are companies say like Abnova or their Biorad, they also have commercial kits. You do not have to really do too much work. You have to take the kit. You have to just follow the protocols, whatever they step-by-step uh, -step procedure mentioned in the manual. So this is the strip that he is peeling off. This is the gradual IEF pit, uh, pitch. I'm sorry, pitch in strip. Okay. So this is commercially available, uh, and you have to be careful now. You have to peel this, and you have to keep it on your sample. You'll see those markings here. These are the markings in black there. So this is also a pH gradient strip. Now this strip is of 13 centimeter and uh, the pH gradient is from pH 3 to 10, okay? So you have a holder here, this white color thing, and you put your protein sample. The protein also has this dye in here. So you have pipetted in your protein sample. Now you're going to lay over the IEF strip. That is the isoelectric focusing. You have a cover fluid. You have to cover because I told you that you'd not leave the uh, stuff dry like that. In protein, this hydration is very important. And then you cover it. This is a unit. This is. So this has basically, this is like a power pack. We'll have two electrodes and you are going to keep so that uh, positive and negative. And now you run the sample. Okay. 
okay so that is how you do it in the maybe there is a second dimension also after that what you do is basically you remove the strip and you put that strip on the sds page okay i don't see the video here but you saw the animation you saw the 2d gel um, the animation before you saw that how the tube gel was kept on the sds gel so that is how the same thing here also they will do is they will remove the ph strip and then they will <clears throat> put it on the sds gel okay and then you are going to run the gel so that will be the second dimension the molecular weight is going to be the second di dimension the first dimension was isoelectric point that is the pi okay uh, any doubts no ma'am no okay and um just a minute 